us to continue that we know who we are. We know about all the natural world. They call us a, a natural world people. All the dances are all of uh, the natural world things like uh, they'll have duck dance and like a woman's dance, they'll give their feet shuffle on the floor. And that's their connection to the Mother Earth. Oh, what was it like when I was here, when I was a baby? Remember all the people that were sitting here? There was a lot of people that day when they bring you through the house. And they'll give the name of this child that was born. Look at this child now that it's up to all the people to be watching that, to give that child whatever she needs to grow up to be strong and healthy, to be ungwe to be, to be mohawk and uh, to be ungwe what it represents, it's like a real, what the translation is, like a real person, a whole person. It's good money, but the older you get, it gets harder for you. The companies don't want you when you get older. If you can't cut it climbing and all that stuff, and uh, you know, they don't need you no more. They want young guys to do their stuff for them. That's what happens to all the old timers. I figure I got another five, ten years, and if you don't fall off and get hurt and get killed. One story, and I'll tell you. When you when you when you fall, it's like one second, and you hit the ground. It's a sudden stop that hurts. Then <laughs> did you get up again? I got up. The bar joist fell right next to me, and I was lucky. I was lucky. I was able to get up. I fell. Remember that time yeah. I fell on 86th Street? I broke my two legs, I was in the wheelchair and, you know, and uh, as soon as I was back on my feet, I went right back to, I had to go right back to work. I don't know anything else. I don't know how to do anything else, but I didn't work. I didn't even think of when I fell. I talk about it now, it's funny now, but you know, when I fell, it hurt. <laughs> I fell off a couple times, and look at my hand, if, if you want to show it. I lost a finger here. I crushed this one a couple of years ago. It's not uh, the best place to be. I've been doing iron work for 14 years. My father was an iron worker. I dropped out of school in 10th grade and I joined the Marine Corps. So I did three years in the Marine Corps. When I got out of there, I was, I had no direction. I didn't know where to go. And the iron working business was the only thing open to me. So I just followed that road. Well, I don't have any training in anything else. So I wish I had training in something else, but it's all I, it's all I know. How old were you when you began? 15, 15 years old. So who decided that? I decided it. I told my father that I was getting smacked around and everything in school and hit and everything. My father says, you don't like it, quit. And my father brought me to go to work. Around 69, I took my apprenticeship program. I, uh, I went for a class, there was 500 men in there, or 500 boys at the time. And I scored good. I came in 102 or something like that. And I had no, I didn't even have a high school, but I faked it and I got accepted. And that was that. I 
I'm with you was the, the World Trade Center. Up and I, I worked at the 86th floor on that one. And, uh, later I went up to the observation when it was uh, finished. We just finished the World Trade Center. My father was uh, 55 and his knees gave out on him. He couldn't even walk up the three flights of stairs. His knees were so bad. But he, he was lucky, he lived to around 72. So it's a hard life for iron workers. That cold weather and, uh, you know, they make you work hard, <clears throat> I'm telling you. The highest building, I worked on the, uh, uh, the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City, New York, uh, 60, 64 floors. And also on the uh, Trogsnex Bridge, the tower was, I think, 300, 300 feet tower. That's the uh, highest uh, yes. building and bridge that I worked on. Well, the Empire State is 110 Chrysler building. They're all, they're all big skyscrapers, 40, 50, 60 floors, Triborough Bridge. The Whitestone Bridge, every job it was Indians working on these buildings and bridges. Well, the Trade Center would be the highest. 110 floors and a 400 foot antenna. Oh, that Trade Center was. Well, yeah, uh, the winters were bad. Uh, there was ice forming on the buildings, and uh, sometimes they wouldn't have to close the streets off because ice was falling on people. and. Uh, it's very windy at that area. I worked on the Brooklyn Bridge. I was there like a couple months, all repairs. It was something I never done and something I enjoyed. The best part of it that I liked was working on the cables. We were putting the clamps on and there was thousands and thousands of clamps that had to go on. and we were all just hanging like spiders on a whip. <laughs> it was a good job. In the early 30s, it used to be like a skeleton, but on the outside of your building, it's just straight down. There's no, there was no safety uh, on the outside perimeter. Well, they did come up with safety nets on the Rainbow Bridge. Which is from Ontario to Niagara Falls, New York. The honeymoon bridge. <laughs> <laughs> were you there on your honeymoon or were you uh, No. There? Yes. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about safety. That's the first time we used the safety nets for that bridge. Because the water was from the falls and the depth of it was, was like a rapid safety. We had one uh, mishap. He fell in. That was the only casualty we had. He was saved. But erecting steel is he's just on top on a column and a beam or any kind of wind or something. Would, the river he's on his own scaffold plus he's got planks below unless if a guy would fall on the outside of the building well then he goes all the way down but here's back before the safety really come in strong they used to work open floors would be about maybe 10, 12, 14, 15 floors open. Yeah, well, most of the jobs, the, they always uh, told us to tie off. But now, just lately, they're coming out with uh, harnesses and uh, special equipment that really protect you if you fall. When I first started in New York, I was in Kingston, New York. I wasn't married. I was working for my wife's uncle, and uh, 
We were on a bridge and I didn't see what happened, but he fell and killed him, you know, got killed. And I drove his car home that night to New York and I was talking to him. Isn't that a weird thing? I was, Rosie's car, I was driving a car and there was times I'd catch myself talking to him. But you see things you don't, uh, you see too many, you know. Some are very, very unpleasant. We lost a fellow on the, on the narrows bridge inside the tower, in an elevator shaft. It wasn't pleasant, because you had to go and wash it down with a hose. It wasn't nice at all. I've had the bad luck to be on the same job when my son fell. Luckily, he just broke a leg and punctured a lung, broke a few ribs, but it's, it's not a nice experience. There's nothing like Friday after work, because that's going home. We're all together. We help with the ride, we pay for the gas, and we help with everything, because we're running two households. It'd be too much for one guy to do both have an apartment in New York and run your house in Canada. You know, this is our family. We're our family, all gonna know what you're doing. Anytime I was ever away from the reserve for more than three, four days at a time, I was always in a hurry to get back. You know, I remember my first job coming to New York. I was counting the, the sleeps before I was going home. I would wake up in the morning, ah, four more sleeps. Uh, three more sleeps and the countdown was on. And, we pull out right away, try to beat the traffic. Which is hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> the Friday traffic in New York is hard. Once you're out of the city, you got it made, you know? I paid between six and a half hours to get home. So we're home at 11, 11 at night. So it's not too bad. We deal with it. It's our lifestyle. It's our livelihood. Our families are accustomed to it, just like our mothers and fathers and continuing on, our grandfathers and so on. But it's a, it's a hard life to live, to be away from your family all the time. I miss him uh, all week. I worry about him uh, on the job. You know, and even when he's out on the street in New York, I worry. But uh, he calls me and makes sure that he's, he's okay. How long have you been married? Uh, it's going on 27. It's 27 years. 27 years. And how old were you when you got married? Uh, I was 17. And you? Fifteen. Well, in them days, uh, you get married young. You were not the only ones, I guess. Yeah. Something. Most of our friends got uh, married young. I think we were a little bit mature than most kids are today. Yeah, we already had a house. And how many children did you have? Oh, we have uh, three. A boy, he's uh, Dean, he's uh, 27. And there's uh, Rhonda, yeah. she's 21. Three. Oh, 23, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then uh, Governor Noro, 14. 14. My son will be eight in a couple of weeks. Yeah. My daughter, six. And uh, the youngest, another boy, is uh, three. It's hard to leave, man. Yeah, they have a hard time with it. They don't like to see me go. Okay, everybody down here, let's get suited up. If you don't have your equipment, just put on a sweater for today. Go, pick it up, pick it up.
the little um, lacrosse players that they play in uh, St. Regis, Agasasna. They have three teams out there and they play against them. So it brings the two communities together and it helps keep the kids off the street and us out of trouble, you know. I have a picture of my grandson that plays lacrosse. He's small, five year old. You look good. Yeah, thank you. Still <laughs> healthy, there's no problem. Yeah, I got no problems. I'm just I'm just getting older every day, I guess. But I don't want to get old. <laughs> <laughs> was your husband an iron worker? Yeah, he was. What was his name? John E. Mayo. For how many years? Oh, for God's sake, I don't know, maybe 45 years. Iron worker on the top. In the States? Eh? In the States? Yeah, in the States. All in the States. All over in the States. Did you always live here? Yeah, I was born right here. Yeah, yeah I was born here. And I just live around the neighborhood. I'm just here um, taking care of my mother for now. She's always lived here? Oh, yeah. yeah. Never <coughs> moved anywhere else. She's always been here, ever since she got married. It's the place I grew up, all my friends are there, my family, everything. That's my whole life. It's like you know everybody here. When you walk into, say you go down to the Knights of Columbus or to the Legion or to the Moose, you walk in, everybody knows you. I was born and raised here, and I always loved it here. I went to school here. My family, they all love it here. My wife, my children are very happy to be back here. I wouldn't sell it, I wouldn't give it away. And the rest of the people also feel the same way. From right here in Ganawagi. That's the only thing we have left. We'll never give it up. Fire Brigade is considered a volunteer department, and uh, our membership is up to 35 men and women. Our, our philosophy is uh, anyone who needs assistance, we respond to. So our neighbors on occasion have uh, called us for fires and, uh, and ambulances. As an example, we, it was last year, we went uh, to Shadagi City Hall and assisted them in uh, putting out the four-story or three-story city hall.
the young people. Everybody is born with a special gift. And what they refer to as the ones that aren't born yet, their faces are coming up from the ground. That's the future. That's what they refer to as the future. And you, you're coming. They're looking for you. That's why at the Longhouse now, they're trying to get the, the younger kids to go there and, you know, to listen to them, what's on their mind, and talk the Mohawk language, you know, to bring it back, that we're uh, on the verge of losing it. They have their festivals and their uh, social dances. Yeah, so all, it's nice when all the young kids get together and they go to the Longhouse and they make a night of it and have their socials. And everybody's welcome. There's different times of the year that different things are coming up. We talk about now that this is harvest, now that we have everything stored away, now it's time to celebrate. It's a time to be happy. decided that he no longer wanted to do that. He decided that he wouldn't come up this morning. What would happen if the water decided not to come? Then the people would be sad. Uh, how many years did you work as an iron worker? Well, I'll say uh, 24. Yes. 24 years. New York, Boston, Detroit, and uh, Kentucky. I used to come home only every second week. 800 miles. That's a little too far to come home every week. Was it good? to work as an iron worker? Yeah. Much better than the farm. Yeah? On a farm, from daylight to sundown, too much work. So in your family, were you the first one to go as an iron worker? No. My brother John, my brother, older brother Tom, my younger brother William, they left me at the farm. And so how many generations of iron workers in your family? What I know of is at least three. My great-great-grandfather, grandfather, and my father. Now he passed away, um, what is it, five years ago? So he would have been in about uh, 54, 55 years in the business, in the union. And you got your 25-year pin? Yeah, I just received my 25-year pin. Uh, two years ago. So I have already been in the local 27 years. And how about your great-grandfather? Angus, Angus Horn. He was out of Chicago. He must have been in the local uh, 55 years before he died. Did you learn with your father? Yes, yes, he helped me. He taught my brothers too, uncles here. They were all iron workers. That was all right from here, from Ganawagi. On August 29, 1907, the south side 
of the Quebec Bridge had collapsed on its own weight, dragging a hundred men to their death. And there was only uh, one post office we had in Ganawaga, and that was the only place they had a telephone. As they found the men, they would call to this post office and they would announce names of the dead of the Ganawaga iron workers. And the men uh, of a lot of Ganawaga Rono, 36 of them had perished. 36 of them, yeah. As I don't think they ever recovered that steel. The water's so deep, they were probably stuck. Well, my father worked on Quebec Bridge, the first section and the second section and to the end. John Batish Kanayan used to shoot the rabbits with a team of Indians. The Mohawks had been engaged in hauling stone by river barges from Ganawaga to the bridge site. While on top of the structure of the bridge, they got around the steel so good, they were not afraid of height. The superintendent saw what, how they were getting run on steel. They were then hired uh, to learn how to become an iron worker. After 1860, after the Victoria Bridge was finished, they started travel to the States, look for work. They travel all over. I have a good story about iron work. I had finished a job in Quebec City. When we finished, he says, I have a job for you. I says, yes, where? He says, Newfoundland. We got to St. John, Newfoundland on this boat, which was the uh, SS Caribou. But that boat, SS Caribou, after a couple of years, it was wartime. They had destroyed that boat that was torpedoed by the Germans. The boat that we were, went on, going and coming back, SS Caribou. And we're looking for this, where is this job? The big city of Newfoundland, St. John. Where's... So we inquired at the uh, police station. And that's the first time we saw the left-hand drivers, like they have in England. The streetcars are running left and, and the cars. You're kidding which me. Was, <laughs> we were surprised. But anyway, we went to the police station. We saw the chief, and we questioned him. It was late in the evening. He started to laugh. We passed the job 210 miles. The job was in Gander, Newfoundland. So he says, uh, boys, 
sleep here. And the monk says, we won't lock you up. Yeah, when well, you were sleeping, was it like in a jail? Well, he let the doors open. He didn't, he didn't lock us up. <laughs> anyway, we went back next morning, and we finally got to uh, the uh, job site, Gander, New Holland. The hourly was, I think, a dollar and 25 cents. But we worked all kind of hours, seven days a week, rain or shine. We made very good money. to grade four, so that's total immersion Mohawk, and then after that, they go into half English, half Mohawk, and they get their French. I teach them how to do their sewing, their cleaning, and caring for the kids, the baby, and the gardening. We have a garden. <laughs> they, they learn how to plant and pick their foods and that. We were talking about iron work, you know? But now there's so many things that I got friends who are nurses, who are uh, studying to be lawyers, and there's people here that can have their own business, businesses now. Before, there wasn't much like that. Well, it, it would be nice for something to come in here in Kahnawake for the future of the children, which would be very nice. The kids are trying, trying their best. I was introduced to scuba diving through my brother-in-law. He got me into the course, and then from there on, I've been pushing myself. Like this past winter, I've taken 10 certifications to become a dive master. It's a dangerous sport. You can have a long expansion anywhere from 30 feet up. You know, it's one of the main accidents that happen. But there hasn't been one accident here on the reserve since we've been diving the last four years. Kids are finding out it's an easier way to make money than freezing the winter and sweating the summer, you know? Today, they can earn the same amount of money by having a real good education and branching out into something else. Believe me, I didn't want my son to do it. I was totally against it, but what can you do? Oh, yeah, they like, they like school. But they, I think they like their summer vacation, too. Yeah. <laughs> Did you live in the States at that time, or did you travel? No, we, uh, we moved there in 61. In Brooklyn? In Brooklyn, on State Street. My parents moved there, my, my sister finished her schooling over there, and uh, we uh, stayed there for almost 20 years. My father, my grandfather. Oh, back in um, 1967, 68, and 69, there was like a big boom in New York. Like anybody that really wanted to work could go to work and uh, do the iron. 
as the years went on, it seems like uh, the work is good for five years, then maybe the next seven years it falls out. So sometimes you have to go uh, look for work in other parts of the country. I was in Michigan for two and a half years, and then I, I had to go to Tennessee for one year. But I always brought my family with me, and uh, we stayed out there. So I, I didn't get lonesome. In New York, there hasn't been a big job in at least five years, you know, over 25 floors. So they're really hurting in the city right now. At 73, 74, everything started going down. So I came back here and I did some work here. What are we going to have tonight, pizza? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Saturday? Or... Yeah, maybe Saturday. Mm -hmm. You coming with us? I'm coming yeah, with us. Mm -hmm. I got to work and then I got a softball game on Sunday. A lot of the stuff I talk to the young people about says it's important that you know who you are, know where you came from. Before anything else, you should know what your connection is to the earth. About this tree, I planted it the summer of 91. We bought it, it was 25 years old. And we, we planted it here because we planted it for the strength of the people. That's why it's an oak. The strength of the people and who supported Oka in 1990. There was trouble in Manasadaga in 1990. Our people were resisting the expansion of a nine-hole golf course and the construction of 60 condominiums into the pines. generation. The Mohawks of Kanastadaga fought to get their land rights recognized to no avail. Instead, generation after generation, they watched as their land was being taken away under all kinds of pretenses. protect the, the land. So uh, there was no no discussion about it. So it was. The people at the time, they were feeling low. Their spirits were low because they were losing all their land. Their land was being expropriated. That's when uh, some people got together and they started traveling from community to community to try and raise their spirits back up. Out of that came this song. As they traveled, they picked up all different verses from all over the country. And you'll notice at the end of the song, the people will start begin to go in a tighter circle that represents all the people come together, uniting, come together as one. up through here when I came down. I was shining the light and I just, he came rolling back down the hill. And uh, two of them went running up the hill. Was he able to walk back on his own speed? 
Well, he was on, he was on his knees when he was right there. I had to help him over the fence and carry him back. Scoop your mouth shut, and then they well, start. The I start yelling, then they start beating you with something on the head. About 25 times, there was three guys holding me down. Like we said, there's no more reconnaissance attempt or activity within the warrior perimeter for the time being. Why is that? Because we received the orders for the time being to stop that kind of activities and for the time being we're going to remain outside the perimeter. His eyes. Check his eyes. What's his eyes look like? Are they glazed, dilated? Very shivering. Cool. Very cool. He's lying on his back. He's shivering. Well, my hands were sore. I couldn't move my hands for uh, five weeks. My ears were all, you know, by the time I healed my face, uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, three months at least before I could go back to work because my hands were all screwed up. They won't allow any medical uh, doctors inside the perimeter at all, the Army. Did we have some good Bannock tonight? What? Did we have Bannock tonight? Bannock? Yeah. Fried bread. Oh, I didn't have supper. You didn't have supper tonight, eh? How many bullets did you find by there? Uh, what is this? 30 round? 30 round clip. In the other bag, you had a blackjack and something else in the, in the other bag? Yes. It's also their position. They will not let, allow their doctor to come inside to treat this man. We need a doctor now. And if he goes out... A, I, look at this. We need a doctor. Yeah. And if he goes out, he will not be allowed to return. I know he's stable. He needs some radio, uh, radiography of his, uh, of his head. You guarantee he'll be brought back? I'm gonna promise you that he's gonna be brought back as soon as he's okay. Okay, he is not to be interrogated by no one or anything? No, not at all. Can I have that right, please? In writing, I cannot do that and you know that. Okay. You're gonna have to take my word. See, we took your word at the only thing. I do have a lot of grievances, but I'll leave it to them. I am not going to... We have an injured man. Yeah, I know. I know. Right. Yeah. That was his life is... His, man, and his life is... That's his life one is more most important. important thing to me. That's right. Right. It is the most important thing to me right now. It's the same thing for us. Um, evidently not. But that's neither here nor there on that right now. Uh, it has to be brought back to them that... Uh, and his wife can go with him. No problem at all, or he's... Uh, Maybe he will be examined, treated, and brought back. Are you going to permit us a doctor now? I'm going to have to, to discuss that. We have a doctor right at the treatment center right now. If you could send that doctor in from that treatment center, it would be a gesture on your part. That doctor could be here right now. He's at the treatment center, which is only about four minutes away, <coughs> and he is waiting to be transported here. He's telling me he has stabilized your guys, that your yeah. guys need to go around. I know, I know it, but could I have it reaffirmed by this doctor? Uh, sir, I talked with my doctor by phone, okay? Yeah. And then when I said, okay, he said the same thing as me. Yes, and I'm pretty sure the other doctor will say the same thing, right? And our concern here is for this person. You're, if we're waiting for another 15 minutes... No, no, I'm not, not trying to, I'm not trying to delay nothing, believe me. This is not my decision to Understood. delay. Et uh, cette nuit, eh bien, uh, un, un peloton a décidé, un peloton ou un commando de quatre Last night, a peloton or a commando of four soldiers decided to make a foray into Mohawk territory to see for themselves what was going on. While they were there, they came face to face with a warrior. The warrior called for help and four other warriors arrived. So there was a fight between four 
four soldiers and these five warriors, and one warrior was badly injured. He was reported by the warriors to be practically unconscious. How did your men defend themselves? With the butts of their rifles? The men defended themselves with their hands? Uh, I admit, I can't exactly say just how they defended themselves. Now, the tension is rising a considerable notch. The first physical skirmish. It had been a fairly virulent war of words, but this was a foray, and there was no telling what would happen over the next few days or even the next few hours, which might be crucial. With a possible skull fracture, wouldn't it be better to uh, move him to a hospital? Uh, I think that uh, when uh, his condition is stable enough to allow a safe transfer, uh, uh, that uh, he should be moved. He's very, very severely injured. Uh, it's possible that he could die. part was when um, the army, when they dragged him down the hill and they beat him up, I think that was the, it was the worst. I thought he was going to die and uh, everybody start, they wanted to go out and shoot. And that's when all the women had to hold the guys back so there wouldn't be any trouble because of what they did to him. I told them last night the messages I've received from across this country by telephone and telex that they've awakened many Indian nations across this country. I'd like to really pay some respect to one of our heroes who left yesterday. The man is now lying in a hospital as a result of a vicious beating by four or five Canadian Armed Force personnel. And that's representative of what the people inside the camp is doing also. They face a lot of odds, but they know that what they're actually securing is their own future and the future of their children and their children. Last night was very uh, a touching moment for all of us inside the camp. After yesterday's incident, and after the tobacco burning and the prayers for strength, the men went out, each and every one of them, and extended their hand to uh, a 10-month-old child that's inside the camp. They touched her and committed themselves to her future. Yeah, she's my oldest granddaughter. She's six years old, and uh, she was a baby almost one in uh, Oka in 90. She was our Oka baby. When we were in Oka in the TC, everybody, uh, she kept everybody going. Everybody would hold her or babysit her. And she was always smiling. My cousin Lorraine, she used to come downstairs in the morning and she was sitting in the high chair and she would go, good morning, our Oka baby. And she'd go like this. <laughs> she was a good baby, chubby. <laughs> no, I don't regret it. I was proud. I was there for a reason. I'm just glad no one got killed. I want to be there with my husband. Is there any change in... Oh, sure. Explain um, what will happen with Spud Ranch. Will the military police perhaps lay charges for, against him? For the time him? being, uh, like I said yesterday, uh, right now uh, this injured warrior is under our protection and it will remain so until further order. Like, I, like I've mentioned, the deal that was uh, put forward uh, yesterday was that the, uh, 
The military had to provide the security for the movement of the warrior to the hospital and during his stay at the hospital. And like I said in French, we just, uh, I just heard a few minutes ago that uh, that protection could be extended. I never had a code name and my son was under the name of a sledgehammer which is part of a tools of the ironwork. So I, I just came to my head, I'll say, well, uh, it's part of ironwork and uh, I'll, I'll use spud wrench. I think I couldn't go back to Ganawage for two, three weeks, something like that. Yeah, after the people uh, came out and then they, we were allowed to go back to the to Ganawage. Yeah, we went to the caretakers. He let us watch TV there when they were all coming out of Oka, the TC. And when I seen them come out, I seen my daughter-in-law with the baby. Then I seen my son Dean, and I started to cry. I wanted to faint, and he took me back here, and I couldn't watch it any longer. It was too much, too much to take. I thought maybe they were gonna get killed or really beaten up, you know. I didn't want to see it. There was a lot of pressure on me because I had all my family there. Instead of just worrying about myself, I had to worry about everybody else. And that was a lot of stress on me. It wasn't nice to see them getting all thrown to the ground and seeing all the kids I don't know what I would have done if I was there. But when they got back on the buses, that's when I felt so relieved. I knew nobody got shot. If they were going to jail, at least nobody got killed. That's what I was happy about. And once they let them into Ganawaga, and then they let us go back to then they had a big supper for us at the Knights of Columbus. The Mohawks have never surrendered to anyone. I don't think they ever will. And uh, what we're talking about here, sir, is honorable disengagement for all parties. I'm happy I went, and I'm happy I helped my people. I'm very happy. I'll do it again if I have to. No regrets. Yes. the federal government, provincial government, the army, the police, the protesters did what they could to bring us down, to tear us apart. The more united they stood and the stronger they became. What has happened is it's strengthened this community much more than people will ever know. They keep forgetting that there's a younger generation that's coming up who have gone through, who have seen what's happened and are going to be teaching their children and talking to their children about what's happened the summer of 1990. Do you like the baby? Do you like the doll? Hey, you like it? I know. While it's growing, <laughs> And it gives off the strength. When we need the strength ourselves, even in the family, we come and we hold on to the tree or we touch the tree and we ask it for the strength. I don't know, I, it's always a struggle. Their whole life, you know, it's, it's gonna be a struggle. And that's, I wish it could be easier for them, you know? They're so special. They don't know how lucky they are right now, you know? It was better the first year, but uh, you try to forget about the bad things. Just 
start living your life again and provide for your family and stuff. But that's what I try to do, just try to get it out of my memory. You know, and just keep on living. <laughs>